The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. This is Don Elliott with Clarion Associates, and uh, thank you for registering and signing on to uh, this webinar on uh, tiny houses and the not-so-tiny questions they pose for planners. In the possibility that some of you uh, are going to take a minute or two to get uh, the technology working, I'm going to pause for 30 seconds, wait for, uh, see if, uh, see if uh, anybody needs time for their computer to behave properly, and then we'll, we'll move into our topic for the day. All right, by way of background, um, this uh, webinar is oversubscribed. I can see on my dashboard here that uh, all 100 of the people who we were able to accommodate have signed on. However, we know from the registration list that many, many more wanted to get on. So if you have a friend who was trying to get on this webinar and they cannot for some reason, uh, we'll give some information at the end of this and we'll pass it around to all the registrants. Um, if you contact us, we're happy to provide this PowerPoint to you or to any friends you know that were signed up and didn't get on. And we're also recording this session. So we will be able to uh, give you that link at the end, and we will also provide that to other folks that cannot get on to the webinar. So uh, we will do our best to make this information available. With that, let's get going. Uh, the presenters today are um, myself and Pete Sullivan. Uh, I am based in the Denver office of Clarion Associates. I'm a director, I'm a planner lawyer with, uh, sheesh, now it's three decades of experience and uh, written a couple of books regarding zoning, writing development codes for cities and counties across the U.S. and Canada and other countries is what I do for a living. Um, my co-presenter is Pete Sullivan, who's in our Chapel Hill office. Uh, Pete, would you introduce yourself a little bit? Thanks, Don, and hello from Chapel Hill, North Carolina, everyone. My name is Pete Sullivan, also with Clarion Associates. Glad to be here today, and thanks for your interest in our tiny topic. Okay. Now, if any of you um, cannot hear, uh, please send a chat, get in the chat box and send us a chat and say, I couldn't hear Pete. You should have heard him give you about a sentence of introduction. We'll hope that that worked, but I will count on people telling us if it did not work for some reason. Uh, we can usually get uh, information. Now, so let's go one more here. Uh, Clarion Associates is a national land use consulting firm. Many of you, I think, know us because I recognize your emails from the registration list, but uh, we do planning and write development codes for, for communities all across the U.S. The map on the screen now shows about 100, some of the 140 or so where we have worked with local communities on, uh, on development codes. Um, we've got an office in Chapel Hill, an office in Denver. We have office, uh, affiliate offices in Cincinnati and Chicago and, and Philadelphia. But this is what we do. We do plans, we do codes, we do special studies, and uh, the vast majority of the work we do is for public governments. Um, we also try to do best practices research and find emerging trends and either write or speak about them to try to keep ourselves abreast of the uh, of things and to try to try to try to make sure that 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 we can advise our clients on new and current topics. And that's how we got into the tiny house uh, topic today. So let's move on and, and kind of get started. There's an awful lot to talk about in this topic. And by the way, uh, we're going to run through this presentation and try to leave some time at the end for questions. Uh, we know you may have questions at the end of this process. So, well, hang on a minute while I try to advance the slide. There we go. We'd like to cover these topics. First of all, tiny houses. What are they? Um, and to clarify and narrow in on that topic, where are they being allowed and how are they being regulated? Originally, we talked about two different topics and tried to separate those two, but you can't. Um, the question of where communities are allowing them to be placed and under what conditions are kind of inextricably intertwined. And so we'll deal with that together. And that is the bulk of today's presentation. 
Um, I sometimes get asked, are they a potential source of affordable housing? We're all trying to deal with this country's serious housing affordability problems. Uh, it's national in addition to being very bad in some markets like Denver. Uh, but these are small. They don't cost as much as a stick built house. Maybe this is what we should be looking at. So we're going to talk about that a, a bit. And then, as I mentioned, try to leave time for questions at the end uh, of this time. So those are our topics. So when I talk to clients or potential clients about how they want their development codes written, uh, they often say, well, can you accommodate tiny homes? And, and I have to turn around and say, well, what do you mean when you say a tiny home? It's a popular topic uh, ever since Susan Suzanka's book on small houses. People have been focusing on this, seems sustainable, potentially off the grid, and so and, and more efficient. So you need to sort out, are we talking about just houses, cottages? stick belt houses that just happen to be small. There's clearly more interest in that around the country and most new development codes do accommodate those types of smaller stick belt houses. Or are we talking about one of those cute as a button wooden slope roof things I saw going down the road or I passed a lot and there was one of those sitting on it and I thought, what is that? Uh, or is it something else? Got a picture on the screen of a, a container house, but there are myriad other ways in which you can live small. Just to clarify, the main topic today is this middle one. It is those wooden, usually wooden, transportable wheeled things that have sloped roof, roofs, uh, look like a small cottage, but clearly can be moved from place to place, clearly are not a full-size manufactured home. Um, we will be dealing with other topics as well, pr primarily at the end of this, but I want to make sure we cover this topic because I get questions from planners who say, look, this guy just walked in and said he owned one and he didn't know where to put it. And I'm not sure how we do or should regulate these things. We're not going to deal with what I call the fringe. Um, you can get on the web and entertain yourselves for hours about funky little custom things that people have built that look like they'd be fun to spend a weekend in, maybe longer. Uh, but um, those are, you know, these are one offs. Uh, we're going to try to stay near the mainstream of what about those wheeled small trailers, which I find if you get into the American Tiny Home Association or the other websites, that's basically what people are talking about or, or the main theme we want to address. So before we do, I want to give one piece of background. Um, I know from the sign-up list that some of you are experienced planners. You have a lot of, and many of you work for local governments. Um, on the other hand, I also know there are tiny home advocates. And there are probably people signed up who just bought one or want to buy one and want to know what to do about it or how they can use it. So I want to go through very quickly how we think through the levels of land use control that govern where can you put them and under what conditions. First, you always have zoning regulations. And zoning does is what can be built on the property and what, can, what activity can you do in that structure. So what can I build and what use can I make of it? Subdivision regulations are separate. Planners know this. A lot of the public doesn't keep it straight in its mind. Subdivision does not address what can I build and how can I use it. It addresses, is this parcel of land approved for development? You can sell agricultural land till the cows come home. And you can sell lots of types of land till the cows come home. But the basic, but, but you can't assume that it is available to live on for more than a tiny period of time unless it is complies with subdivision regulations. So that's the second level. Third is, of course, building codes. Is the structure itself safe to live in? And fourth is private covenants. Now, the first three of these are addressed by local government. The fourth is private. It is a private set of laws among property owners in an area, usually put in place by the original developer of the area. And he said, or she said, Look, uh, zoning would allow X, but we're not going to allow it here. Uh, or zoning, or we just want to have a separate level of quality control or dues or a community center or something. Private covenants are private law. The rest are public law. And I want to be clear, private covenants, the government does not enforce private covenants in almost any community with the possible exception of, of uh, Fort Worth. The, uh, you basically, when you... When you walk in and say, you have to zone my property to match my covenants, the local government says, no, we don't. Uh, that is your private law. You put it on the land. It runs with the land. You're binding each other. Go sue each other because we are not involved in this. 
So if I address the first or Pete and I address the first three boxes and you're hung up on private covenants, you've got a problem. And we can talk about that at the end because the government can rarely deal with that issue. We're going to focus primarily on zoning and subdivision today, but we're also going to talk about building codes. And, and a matter of fact, that's where we're going to start. So, Pete, could you talk a little bit about building codes and how they uh, affect tiny houses? Thanks, Don. Now that we've discussed what mechanisms control where people can live, then what about that next question? Where can I put that darling little tiny house I saw cruising down the highway? Well, as Don mentioned earlier, where you can put a tiny house and how they're regulated really is the same intertwined question. But maybe I should be saying instead how they are not regulated. Next slide. In our research, we did not find many examples of tiny houses named explicitly in zoning codes. But all basic zoning regulations are going to have rules governing structures intended for human occupancy. With tiny houses, someone is going to live there, and, and that's what we care about. And that's where things get interesting and, and technical. Next. And next slide. And one more click. Okay. Okay. If you're going to live somewhere, there are federal standards for safety that come into play, and, and any, any professional planner would be quite familiar with these because many zoning codes are based or, on or incorporate such standards, like International Residential Code, for example. Manufactured home, for, for a manufactured home, this you know, would mean minimum space requirements, structural safety, utility hookups, uh, occupancy requirements. For an RV, you might not have all of those same federal standards, but you're going to have highway standards. We can't have these things clipping an overpass as you drive down to your tiny lot. And the, the local municipality is certainly going to have a, a say or want to have a say in where these things go. Next slide. And before we talk about what these cute as a button, as Don said, tiny homes are and how they might be classified, what happens if these things don't fit that nicely into these main categories that I talked about? What if it's not a manufactured home or a mobile home? What if it's not an RV? What if it's just something else that doesn't fit in the code? Well, it might be camping then, um, quite frankly. If a type of housing does not meet building codes, federal standards, safety requirements, highway standards, then the local municipality might say that's pretty much like living in a tent. And many local codes do address camping and usually there's something like a 30-day uh, requirement and then you need to move along. So whether it's a, a tent from your recreational outfitter or something a little more sturdy, if it's not manufactured homes or RV, it might be classified as camping and you might be out of luck in terms of locating a tiny house as a permanent resident. Next slide. If you are camping, whether it's tent camping, RV camping, you on a permanent basis might need to either find a campground or an RV park or some other place specifically designated for a, a camping activity. But if we're interested in an individual tiny house on an individual lot that doesn't have some subdivision uh, regulations governing the area or some other kind of uh, covenant, then wh where does that leave us? Next slide. So again, to review, if the structure, the housing structure, never had wheels and it meets the building code, it's a house, plain and simple. If it has wheels or had wheels that were removed, then it needs to meet HUD occupancy or RV safety requirements. It's either a manufactured house or an RV, and most likely it needs to go into a mobile home park or a manufactured park, home park, uh, because those are different than normal subdivisions, or maybe RV park rules would apply. If it's something else, next, it would be camping, as we just discussed. Next slide again. So, what are we talking about for these tiny homes? Well, this is an RV. How do we know? Because it says so right on the Tumbleweed website. So is this company just selling these as permanent housing and as you're driving away from the sales lot, the folks that sold it to you are saying goodbye and good luck with your zoning. Well, this wouldn't be the first time that a housing product has evolved faster than use classifications in a zoning code. 
And that's why Clarion always advocates that planners build flexibility into how you define uses. But I digress. Don, please tell us more about which communities have allowed these light, delightful RVs on a permanent basis and how they're regulated. All right, let's do that. So I think we've gone through, uh, just to recap, the, everything that you live in other than a tent has got to meet some sort of a code. The manufactured code talks about it is designed, it's a federal law designed to regulate when a let's just call it a trailer, what we used to call a trailer, but a manufactured home is safe to live in. Unlike that, the RVs are really about roadworthiness and occupancy for a limited period of time. And that's that's where the crux of this comes into. You've got something designed and marketed as an RV. It is an RV, uh, but it is being used to live in over an extended period of time. And yet it is not really subject to the Manufactured Housing Act on construction standards. And that's why we have this gray area. So thanks for the recap. Let's go back to our table. Uh, we've covered construction codes. Um, and we've covered the fact that, that, that it, there are different types depending upon whether it's a transportable or a non-transportable unit. Let's talk about zoning. What can I build on my property or place on my property? And what use can I make of that? And then we'll come back and talk about subdivisions later. So here's another way to think about what uh, Pete just walked through. If this thing is put on a foundation, um, it's often allowed in residential zones under some conditions. Um, we are, uh, we'll talk about those conditions in a minute. Basically, zoning says, well, is it a residential district? If you've bought land in an industrial district and they don't allow residential, well, they're not going to allow a tiny house either. It's clearly a residential use. So first of all, Look at the zoning district. Is it does it allow single family detached dwellings? That's what this is. Um, uh, if you put it on a foundation, and I'm talking about removing the wheels and hooking it up, or in some communities, we'll talk about is it an accessory dwelling, i.e., for some reason involved in zoning, it is a residential district, but they don't allow two units in this area, so you can't put it on the lot. Or maybe they do allow two units on a single lot, but it would be uh, approved as an accessory unit. Uh, that's a hot topic in planning around the country. Do we or do we not allow a second small housing unit to be placed where a permanent larger house is placed? Uh, it's a popular topic. People are very scared of it. This is just another version of that topic. If you allow them, then we can ask the question, well, does a tiny house qualify? Third, there are minimum size standards. Um, and I want in zoning, and I want to talk about this a little bit. Um, Pete showed some figures from the International Residential Code um, mentioning that the old code said you needed to have at least one room with 120 square feet. The new code, the new 2015 version of the IRC, is moving towards uh, one room with at least 70 square feet. So it is becoming less of a barrier to having these things fit a building code uh, that, that, you, that you could approve. But I want to be clear, that's the building code. That has to do with, is this big enough to occupy? In addition to that, many cities have an occupancy code that say, well, this is fine. It has a, a room of 120 square feet. We're going to say it's occupiable. It's got a bathroom of 18 square feet. All these things have numbers. We say it is occupiable. It's not so small that it's not livable. But there's a limit to how many people can occupy that limited amount of space. Uh, often the figure you see in occupancy codes is about 125 square feet for one or 100 or sometimes lower than that uh, or 125 square feet for more than one. The point is there are about three types of size limits that you need to be worried about. One is in the residential construction code. Two is whether the city or county has an occupancy code that they, independent of the construction, have said, the building is fine. It's just how many people can be in it, occupying it. And you could run into that limit as well. Then number three is actually in zoning. And a number of communities, more in the past than now, but a number of communities have said, look, we're an upscale community. There is no such thing in our community as a house with less than 600 square feet on it, in it. Uh, that's how we are going to maintain quality standards and character. Every house in this neighborhood has at least 1,000 square feet. We hereby deem that any new houses in this neighborhood must have a thousand square feet, not because it's building safety, not because it's overcrowding, 
but because they want to maintain the established character of an area. Now, so that's a third way in which the tiny homes are going to potentially run into barriers. Uh, I've already mentioned the construction code is getting more generous about this. I think that many cities are repealing their zoning requirements for minimum unit size uh, because of the same thing, affordability. Uh, I know that Denver in particular, and we're working in several places where they've just reconsidered. Their old code said minimum 400 square feet, 500 square feet. The new code says, hey. If you can lease it or sell it and you don't and you meet the residential code, uh, we are not going to drive up the minimum size through zoning. And then occupancy limits. So we've talked about these four topics. Is it allowed in the zone district, either primary or accessory? And uh, is it big enough to meet these types of different size standards? If it's got wheels, to recap what Pete said, it's an RV. And RVs are generally limited to parks and campgrounds where support services are provided, meaning showers, meaning sewer hookups that are not too code for a house, but they're good enough for RVs that come and go every week. Water hookups that are good enough for RVs that come and go every week, but that would not be good enough for a permanent house. So, uh, again, uh, if it's got wheels, it's either in a park for a longer period of time or... You say, can I park it on my dad's property? Can I park it on my mom and dad's property? Uh, the answer usually with that is yes for a period of time. And you ask the period of time, they say it's camping. Uh, it is not, if it's not allowed as an accessory dwelling unit, and if wheeled things are not, so if it's wheels, it's not an accessory dwelling unit, you can park it on your dad's property, you can occupy it for 30 days. Um, we, and I've gone around and around with a bunch of people on this and saying, is, is it true that the difference between camping and not camping is whether it's on a foundation or not. And essentially, I'm coming to the conclusion that that's about it. Uh, yes, it's not a tent, but it is a movable structure that is not on a foundation for long-term occupancy. There for its short-term occupancy, and we limit how long you can live in your dad's driveway with the garden hose hooked up to your faucet. So usually there's a time limit again this is local law not federal law or state law so 30 days is common to find so first question is are you going to remove the wheels or not if you're going to remove the wheels and put it on a foundation lots of things open up let's talk a little bit more about this primary or accessory use of property um as i hinted earlier uh, many communities allow a wider range of secondary and subordinate uses of land as long as there's a legal primary use of the property it's another area where non-zoners kind of get scratching their heads. But most codes say, you've, we've got, we, we zone our town or our county to establish the character, protect property values, public health, safety, and welfare. And so the primary things that happen in this zone are X, Y, and Z. But once you're doing one of those things, we're fine with accessory garages. We're okay with accessory sheds, swimming pools. Uh, if you've got a hotel, we're okay with a restaurant, um, they, but they need to be secondary and subordinate to what is the primary use of the property. So again, some communities allow a tiny house as an accessory use because it's not going to compromise the character of that area. Somebody's come in and said, why don't we allow them to put small houses on residential lots? And councilman, councilwoman says, you know what, I wouldn't be too happy if somebody tore down a 2,000 square foot house and put in a 400 square foot trailer. Uh, that is not going to do my property value any good. So uh, we are not going to allow that. And the question then comes up, would we, ex all right, so what if they kept the 2,000 square foot house? Could you put it in as an accessory dwelling uh, beyond that? Uh, and some allow it because they say, fine, that's just like a big, very pretty uh, occupancy shed, if we allow accessory dwelling units, we'll accept that. It's not going to compromise the character of the area as opposed to a primary use. So whether it, you're going to keep the wheels on or not has a lot to do with the calculus of where you can put them. Whether you are intending to put it on a piece of land by itself or as an accessory to something else that is an approved primary use of the land is a second key question that needs to be answered. And the answer to where you can put them depends on largely on those the answers to those questions. So where are they being allowed? Uh, we've looked around. There, this is not an exhaustive list, of course. Boulder, Colorado um, allows them as primary uses of land. To no one's surprise, wheels have got to come off. you got to have foundation, electric, water, sewer connections. Walsenburg, Colorado also. I want to point out that this is one of those cases where 
they're allowed on in some zone districts as a primary structure, meaning I can buy a lot and put this on the lot, even if there's no other house there. But they do have minimum size requirements for houses. And you're going to have to go to the Board of Adjustment and get a variance from that minimum size if your tiny house is smaller than that size. Uh, that's generally what you do uh, if you have a proper use and structure, but there's something about it that doesn't meet the standards of the city. So, and, and again, the must have its own footer and its own separate water and sewer connections. Lawrence, Kansas, and many other cities have kind of a general rule that say, uh, you, you got to have, the, we won't allow these on very small lots. Think about old cities. They often have uh, 25 by 100 foot lots. Uh, that means 2,500 square feet. There are some places that say, look, uh, we're just not going to allow them on real small lots. Um, and it's got to be on a foundation. And by the way, Lawrence allows them as primary uses in some areas and as accessory uses in other areas. Let's talk about the city of the town of Spur, Texas. Some of you may have heard of this. Uh, Spur is small. It has 1,200 residents. And it has billed itself as the first tiny house friendly city. They have gone out of their way to say, move in and bring your tiny house. We welcome you. We want you here. Uh, and you will absolutely be able to live in your tiny house as a primary dwelling. However, even here in a fairly lightly regulated uh, rural community in Texas, you got to take the wheels off. Uh, you got to put it on a foundation and you got to tie it down with a hurricane strap because they have high winds. So, Obviously, the region of the country you're in depends on how you have to put it on the foundation, but that's a, you know, that could be cheaper than other forms of anchoring it. Uh, and you're going to have to have electric water and sewer connections are, are going to be required. So small town clearly advertises itself. Very interesting story uh, by one of the early residents documenting his path to moving there and getting a house on a foundation. Here is that same house in Spur, Texas, on a foundation, properly installed and legal. Um, on the city's website, in holding itself out as a small, as a tiny house-friendly town, they include some estimates as to what it might cost you to do this. Uh, one of them is, and my, we, we have some tax lots. We've got things that the tax assessor has taken for back taxes, and we'll sell them just to get them back on the tax-paying rolls. might pay $1,500, and you might cost you $3,000 to hook it up. Um, the very well documented story uh, on their website talks about um, the fact that, in fact, uh, this person bought three lots. We got $3,500 for the lots. The house cost about $25,000, and the foundation and utility connections were about between five and $6,000. Um, so it was a little more expensive than they thought. As a matter of fact, if you troll the web and look at these stories, uh, it's a common theme. This was not as inexpensive a proposition as I thought it was going to be. Um, however, this is a, this one's very well documented, and it again, those are higher numbers than people might have expected, but they are not high numbers compared to building a new stick-built house. So, again, let's talk a little bit more about accessory dwelling units. Um, I want to reiterate what Pete said earlier. If you go through many zoning codes, you will not find the words tiny house. Uh, they just treat this as an accessory dwelling unit. And so if it qualifies as an accessory dwelling unit, then they will accept it. So, for example, small sheds, uh, most communities say, if you go out and buy a tough shed, we're not going to regulate it. We don't have the time or staff. And by the way, you're not going to live in it. doesn't matter. But if you are getting something else as an accessory dwelling unit, well, which code do you meet? Do you meet the IRC or do you meet the manufactured housing code or the RV code? Um, they always require, almost always, that either the primary unit or the accessory unit be occupied by the owner of the land. For example, you can't buy land with a house in most communities, put an ADU on it, whether it's a tiny house or not, and rent them both out. Most communities say you got to live in one or the other because it's a residential community. And the, the reason we know the, the, the second unit will be a good neighbor is because the guy who owns the land is actually living in the other unit. Um, often they require an access, another parking space for it. One important thing to consider is this. In most communities, you cannot put an accessory dwelling unit or any accessory structure on the parcel before the primary structure is there. So I've heard this scenario. Yeah, well, I'm buying the land. Someday I'll build a house, but right now I'm buying a little house. I'm going to put it on there, and they only accept it as an accessory structure. Can I put it on as an accessory structure and then build the primary structure after that? In most zoning codes, the answer is no. Uh, 
for the reason I gave earlier, that having a house on there for a few years that's much smaller than everything else around it, it's going to compromise the character of the community. We allow these because they're along with what we wanted to happen here, and you need to do the, the thing we wanted to happen first. Who allows them as accessories? Nashville, Tennessee uh, allows them as ADUs, not as primary use it, and only in some districts. Uh, and once again, no surprise, they're kind of, look, if we if you say it's an ADU and we see wheels on it, we say, no, it's camping. Uh, it's not an ADU. Um, we use Beaufort, South Carolina as an example, but many cities treat it exactly this way. You could easily read their accessory dwelling unit regulations and say, hey, I could make a tiny house work for this, and you'd be right. They will allow it, but you never find the word tiny house in there. Uh, don't go looking for the words. Look for accessory dwelling unit and then figure out whether your tiny house meets it. Um, down at the bottom, we've kind of pointed out, we have not found examples of cities that say, well, we like uh, accessory dwelling units, but don't try to put one of those tiny houses over here. We don't like those. We haven't found that. We also have not found any that say uh, we don't like ADUs at all, but hey, we think those little houses are cute. You could put one of those on, even though we would not allow other forms of ADUs. So these things are treated basically by the same rules that govern other accessory dwelling units. Now I want to talk a little bit about subdivision regulations. Um, again, this is not whether I can put it on as a primary or secondary use of land. This is a question, is this land something I can put a dwelling unit on? Uh, is this approved? Um, again, you planners can listen a little bit, but those of you who are not familiar with subdivision, this is something that people often overlook. This is one way to think about subdivision regulations. We have standards for how you lay out legal lots for houses. We have, we've been doing it for 100 years, um, and we apply those kinds of things to some of the other types of houses in here if you're laying out a lot, but it's generally single-family detached stuff. However, that doesn't work if you were trying to create a manufactured home park and sell the lots. Subdivision is designed for, look, once we approve this, you could sell it to an unsuspecting third party, the whole the lot that we've created, and they won't be surprised to find that they can't develop it or that it doesn't have utility service and it doesn't have access. They're going, they, we can say it's a legal lot, it can change hands indefinitely because it's, there are not going to be surprises for the buyer. But that doesn't, the ones we've developed for kind of houses don't work really well for manufactured home subdivisions. They're long, they're narrow, they often have support structures or community rooms or things like that that need to be there because of the nature of these units and the way it's laid out. So we have special regulations for manufactured home subdivisions. These are things where people cannot just lease their manufactured home site, but buy it. They have the same rationale. I want the next buyer to know it's okay. And we have it for RV home subdivisions. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the Jellystone Park concept from years ago where it's, a, yeah, it's an RV, but you can own a lot in it. Uh, and it is treated almost like a subdivision. The, the, the next buyer needs to know that that actually is a legal parcel, not just a leased parcel. So you've got special, you've got RVs, we've got experiences saying, look, we know how to divide up land, but it's different for manufactured homes, and it's different for RVs, and it is different for tiny homes. You can imagine how they differ from both of these, but I put it in the middle because that's how this is going to evolve. Uh, we have not run on to good RV subdivision regs yet. Um, I think they're just in process, and I suspect that in the few cases in the country where people have actually created special ones for tiny homes, meaning the land can be a small amount of land because the home is small, and maybe the infrastructure and maybe the streets can be smaller because they're lower occupancy and lower traffic. That's going to happen. We have not found them so far. The, small, the Tiny Home Association of America is in the process of trying to work on those. So, again... If the zoning is allows it, can I put a, high, a tiny house on this parcel of land? Answer, yes, if it's platted because they've sorted out the utilities and access and boundaries. If it's not, maybe not. Um, and I'll give you one caveat. So it really is important. Check the zoning. Check the subdivision. Uh, if it's already a platted lot, then you're just putting a small house on a lot that was built for a bigger house. If you're looking for special standards, you're probably going to be among the forefront of developing those standards that look and feel differently the same way a manufactured home park does. I will give you a caveat on the bottom. If there are still counties, particularly, and cities around the U.S., primarily in the West and sometimes in the South, that have 
no construction code and are not required by state law to have a construction code. They are very rare. There are also a larger number that don't have subdivision or zoning controls and are proud of the fact that they're not zoned. If you buy land in those areas, some of this won't apply because they, in fact, treat, I mean, they're, they're just anti-regulation. They want to be rural. They want to be agricultural. Uh, they don't think the government should tell you what you could do with your property or how to sell it. That is rare. Um, it's rare to find counties that don't have at least subdivision regulations, although many counties don't have zoning regulations. But if you're going to move your tiny house to a county, um, don't, uh, even though most citizens think of zoning before they think of subdivision, counties think of subdivision before they think of zoning. It is likely that even if your county is quote unquote unzoned, it still has regulations as to what is a livable lot, what is a lot that can be built on for purposes of a house. And many states uh, don't, Colorado, for example, doesn't require counties to have zoning, but it does require them to have subdivision regulations. So let's just talk about briefly, uh, what about a whole community? Look at the quotes on the right. Uh, these are out of uh, websites. What's the next for minimalist houses? How about a subdivision of tiny houses? What about a tiny house village? There aren't many of these out there. There's a lot of talk. They're not good examples. Um, and other than kind of temporary settlements for the homeless, which Pete will talk about in just a minute. And those are one-offs. So, again, we are now at the forefront of figuring this out. The drawing at the upper left of this slide shows a concept plan that somebody has put in front of a county that says, this is what I'd like to do. Parking over here, houses on small lots over there, a kind of a pedestrian circulation pattern and a community building. You could see this as almost like an RV park layout or a manufactured park layout, but with different standards because of the different character of the housing. That's not approved. That's a conceptual drawing that uh, is in the process of discussion, to the best of my knowledge. On the bottom picture, you've got four tiny homes, um, but as to the best of my knowledge, this has not been subdivided. So this is a co-housing development or a PUD that is one lot on which they have approved multiple structures. Um, in which the owners of these things can own the units, but very likely can't sell the land underneath them because it's not a lot. So once again, when you see these pictures, I would be happy to receive emails. I suspect I will from people saying, I know of one. I know of one. Uh, I'll be very interested to get one that is actually a subdivision that actually allows people to put tiny houses and sell them because you actually own the lot underneath and the, and under the, except under kind of a PUD. PUDs are negotiated one off. You can always do a planned unit development to approve whatever you want. That's not the same as having a zone district and standards that a buyer could walk in and say, look, like I want to be in this zone subject to those standards and, and set up a tiny home community. Um, most of these are done through a different, uh, to date so far, are done under a different scenario. Just to wrap up, so we're going to see those come up. Subdiv tiny home subdivision regulations are going to evolve, and we have a lot to work with. Look at the things on this table. Co-housing we have where people own small individual things and part of a common development, and they own a share. It's like a cooperative in the rest of the infrastructure and land in the community room. Um, we've got small lot single family standards, accessory dwelling unit standards, cottage and pocket neighborhood standards. Uh, RV campground, manufactured park, manufactured home standards. Um, we have so many good examples that it's only a matter of time until they be crafted into something that somebody approves. But the reason I organize these into red and blue is that one of the key things to talk about here is what I've been harping on so far. Uh, am I going to be able to sell this lot with the tiny home to somebody else for occupancy? Um, if you are trying to set up or the proposal in front of you is for a community that does not have individual lot sales, uh, then you look at these examples on the left. No, you're just fixing zoning because you're approving a development within which multiple people can occupy multiple structures. We know how to do that. That's like an apartment complex. But we're not worried about them selling pieces of it because it's one lot and it's set up as a thing, a one development. If you're on the right-hand side, and you want people to be able to buy and sell the same way they can buy and sell subdivision lots with stick-built houses on them, you're in the blue category. But we have several examples of how that works as well. So, uh, that, that, but, but, but there, you're going to have to meet, we have to design those standards not only for zoning, but to meet the criteria of subdivision standards, which will vary because of the character of the housing. Last slide of mine is, 
you'll find there are regulations out there that kind of go and address other things. Um, Lawrence, Kansas is pretty clear that just because you have the permission of the owner does not mean this doesn't become camping. I'm getting back to, can I park it in my dad's driveway? No, doesn't matter that he's your dad and you have permission, still camping. Composting toilets are often not permitted. That's important because some of these uh, some of these tiny homes don't have sewer wiring for them. They One of the tricky parts here is you can build these things to match the standards of the Recreational Vehicle Industry Association, and they'll have those kinds of things. But there's nothing to prevent somebody from buying a frame and building a house that does not meet those standards and now and putting in a composting toilet to avoid having to put in sewer. There are a number of places that say that's not going to be allowed. Even if you put it on a foundation, you're not going to have a composting toilet in here. Solar renewable energy often allowed, yes, on the same basis we would allow it on other ADUs or primary structures. Let's let's keep going and talk about the affordability of those things. Pete? Sure. Getting into another one of our main points for today, are tiny houses affordable? And are they a way to get at affordable housing or address homelessness? Well, who are we talking about with affordability? And if you could see me right now, I'd be doing those air quotes. Let's break down the numbers. Don mentioned the costs from Spur, Texas, and you see them again here on the slide uh, in that chart when you factor in cost of land, uh, tying down the foundation, the other, other requirements, that, and the upfront costs. Let's say you got this thing financed. Uh, we'll pick the 20-footer in the middle. You're paying around $450 a month to live in the tumbleweed Cypress. Oh, that's pretty cheap rent, right? Sure. The census tells us that the median U.S. household income in 2011 was $50,000, and HUD tells us that housing is affordable if you're not spending more than 30% of your income on housing. So at this price point, is this affordable housing? Sure. It would actually be affordable to folks making at least 36% of median income um, based on the, uh, when you take the U.S. factor, and that's well within the threshold you housing planners would know of meeting what many municipalities call, quote, affordable housing. So let me mention one thing. Let me jump in, Pete, just uh, something you and I haven't discussed, but that folks may not know. Uh, I think most of you do know. If you do buy one of these, it's going to be financed like a car, like a manufactured home. Manufactured homes in most states, unless they have a state law that says that you treat manufactured homes as, uh, as real estate, are considered an attachment to real estate, and they are financed like a car loan. Uh, these are also financed largely as car, they're vehicles, they're, they're RVs, and I guess I just, I want people to understand when you go to the bank and say, can I get a mortgage to put this on the land? The bank is likely to say, we'll give you a mortgage on the land, but we won't loan on the value of this house because it's not financeable as real estate. It's chattel. It is something that is attached to real estate. So I'm sorry to interrupt you, Pete. That's okay. So we, at this cost per month, we might think of tiny houses as like a one bedroom apartment and that is inexpensive. Um, but moving into a one bedroom apartment doesn't require finding land, finding a place where it's permitted, maybe getting a variance and the other upfront costs and complexity that comes along with tiny houses as we've discussed. Some folks might say, nope, I'd rather just take the apartment and be done with it. Next slide. That third question, could Second. tiny houses oh, there we go. Sorry. improve That's okay. Uh, how we deal with homelessness? Well, if many of you have are familiar with homeless encampments or tent cities or areas that are specifically designated for uh, homeless individuals to live in, in a group setting and have access to communal facilities, and if the goal is a more dignified version of a tent city style homeless encampment, then yes, maybe tiny homes are a very interesting product for housing planners, uh, folks that work in faith-based organizations or other officials or representatives that are trying to make better places for folks that are homeless to, to live and to make a living and, and have a, some kind of place called home. Uh, the, the tiny houses are pre-assembled, they're mobile, they're, they're fully equipped when you add the other communal facilities and so whether it's a temporary encampment or a more permanent encampment, they can be set up and taken down pretty quickly, more uh, safe and dignified and pleasing than um, just you know, a bunch of tarps pulled up and, hey, here, here you go, here's your spot. 
And so this is something that may be of interest to folks that are, are promoting and managing and, and finding land and working with local governments to set up these, these kind of spaces. Next slide. That's an example from Olympia, Washington. Other examples that we found, Eugene, Oregon, Austin, Texas, Madison, Wisconsin. And, but, but is this an individual permanent residence on a single parcel of land? No. There are, if you look at the last two slides, extensive agreements with the local municipality and the sponsoring organization that uh, are writing special rules and covenants to say what can go on here. And that is not the same as just walking into the permit counter and saying, I'd like 50 people to live in these tiny houses. What do I need to do? The costs very, very affordable, $3 per bed per night, um, as you see in that last bullet there. So this is becoming a very viable housing type to address homelessness in, in some of these examples that we've seen. But back to the affordability question, and is this quote affordable housing or not? You have to ask, what, what's the goal and, and who's the end user that we're talking about? If, if it's cheap yet functional primary residence, sure, this may be a new example of many that are out there that are, are part of that mix. And I'll touch on some of the other small houses styles in a moment. If we're talking about a fun backyard dwelling or a camping option for folks that have some extra money to spend on a, on a tiny home away from home, sure, these could be really fun. Or if the goal is to deliver affordable housing to very low income individuals or, or those that we might be fighting homelessness, uh, yes, yes, this could, this could be an interesting tool to add to the toolkit. So the practicality and the affordability shifts depending on which of the three lenses you, you examine the tiny houses with. Uh, next slide. And there, there are other examples of small living. The, the tiny houses are, are just one player in, in what's been called the small house movement that's trending upward as housing becomes very unaffordable in many places. Uh, the effects of the recession linger and with that people want to save money and attitudes are shifting towards a willingness to live in smaller places and live simply. We have complex, increasingly complex lives and, there, and there's a, a, a reaction of, of simplifying. Cottage housing um, this example of this developer was able to put more homes but not exceed the uh, maximum square footage required in the zoning code and worked with the municipality and said, okay, we can put in small houses um, at a higher density than would otherwise be allowed in the code. Next slide. Some of you may have heard of Katrina Cottages. In the wake of Hurricane Katrina, there was a response in the building and architectural community to build more dignified and functional structures than the FEMA trailer that many displaced residents were uh, put up in. And they were named Katrina Cottages and originally designed for Southern climates, but have been allowed in other areas. Don mentioned uh, to me uh, the other day that Buena Vista, Colorado had allowed these. They did have to make sure that snow loading and other structural requirements and other location specific requirements for Buena Vista were met, but they have been allowed. Echo homes, next slide. These have been marketed for elderly individuals. Uh, think your folks, your grandparents would like to live in your backyard in an accessory dwelling unit. So this is a ready-made pre-assembled option and they are designed with uh, enhanced mobility features for those that are older. And next slide, shipping containers. We've probably all seen this in the news and the question is whether it meets construction and occupancy codes. And then really if you just want a cheap place to live, next slide Don, mm -hmm. the bungalow in a box, basically a box of wood that's cut to the right size and they give you the plans. So this is pre-manufactured, you assemble it on site, and it's not much bigger than a shed, but you're going to live in it. So as long as it meets as long as it meets local codes, then the bungalow in a box is an option. And we did find that it comes in less expensive than a tiny home on wheels because it's not having to meet the highway standards, RV standards and such that the tiny homes are. Can you drag that thing off the lot behind your car as easy as a tiny home? No, obviously not. But for a, a permanent residence, if it meets the local zoning, that could be also a affordable option.
And I think we're ready to summarize, Don. I'm seeing about 10 minutes left in our time, so can you bring it home and let's do some questions? I will. And before I do, I, I want to just point out that um, uh, tying this back again, uh, we, we wound up with these examples of other types of small living, uh, as Pete described it, which is great. One of the barriers that continues to to, ra to rise up is that whether it's cottages, whether it's Katrina cottages, whether it's bungalow in a box, is this is this question, this, this logic tells you or tells many people, hey, this is smaller. It's going to be a smaller household. It's going to have less traffic. Uh, it ought to be allowed in smaller areas with smaller infrastructure. The pipes maybe could be smaller. The roads could be narrower. The drainage is there's a less impervious surface created by the roof, so we're going to have less rainwater to worry about our neighbors. Uh, shouldn't all of those standards be tweaked in order to allow this wide variety of small living to, to kind of capture the efficiency of the housing unit in the efficiency of land development? And logic tells you yes. But I have to tell you, that has not happened in very many jurisdictions. Uh, that's why we went on that long round discussion about subdivision regs. Now, often, even if the zoning says, we'll allow you to put this on a pretty small lot, smaller than we used to think we would allow. Let's say, for the sake of discussion, 2,000 square feet or 1,500 square feet. We're, we're progressive. We'll do that. Trying to get the streets. Okay, fine. Now you got more lots. They're scaled to the houses or the units. But you're still going to have to meet subdivision standards on how big the pipes are, how big the wires are, how big the roads are, unless the jurisdiction makes the extra effort to draft smaller ones. Now, there is pressure in that direction. And as I mentioned earlier, the, the Tiny Home Association of America is working to try to move in that direction. But I would just urge folks not to underestimate the fact that just because you can get the unit small and you can get the lot small does not necessarily mean the size of the infrastructure will follow a pace in a way that allows you to capture as many of those savings as you thought you could yet, although we all hope it'll move in that direction. Let's summarize where we've been and then take some questions. Just to read through these, because this is kind of how I think you need to, to think about it. Um, any place you're going to live for an extended period of time, i.e. not camping, uh, must meet construction codes of some type. Transient living does not. Uh, tent, okay. Park it in your dad's driveway for 30 days with the wheels on, okay. Have wheels on and put it somewhere else, okay. But you're probably limited in time. And if you want to live longer than that, you're going to have to meet some construction code. So be careful that you're checking that and you know which of these construction codes you're going to apply. Uh, the, the firmament is not settled out there. There's no website with the Tiny Home Association construction standards. There are Manufactured home, there's uh, uh, RV, but you're going to have to decide as a city which one you want to apply for this longer living. Units that have wheels or RVs, living them as restricted parks or short term. We have not seen the emergence yet of good standards. When I see them, they're all PUDs. They're all co-housing. They're all one-offs that are negotiated for a particular, usually a very small piece of land that is a a long-term one-off negotiation, not standards that you could replicate very easily from community to community. Um, living outside RVs, we talked about 30 days. Um, uh, almost always, in order to get around the 30-day, it has wheels on it issue, you're going to have to put it on a foundation and hook it up to utilities. That's and in the current status of things, just the way it is, unless you find a county or a city that chooses not to regulate those things, which is not common. Uh, installing it, if you're trying to install it as an accessory unit, it depends entirely on the zoning code and whether this is a legal structure. Remember, if you build an accessory dwelling unit over your garage, you're going to have to meet the construction code for a habitable space. Well, there's no reason it should be any different when you move uh, a, a tiny home on to use it for the same purpose. Again, installing it as a primary dwelling unit is uh, the same. It's going to be, can you meet the basic standards for a house? Uh, Often, you can't meet the minimum size standards in zoning, even though you can meet the minimum size standard in construction and occupancy, but that's going away. Uh, that, that's one area in which uh, regulatory trends are going in favor of these things. There are fewer instances in which you can't put a residential tiny house on a residential lot because it's not big enough. They're not cheap, meaning in two different ways. They're not cheaply built. In general, they're well built. And they are not as inexpensive as many people think. Uh, on a per square foot basis, they can be fairly expensive. Uh, 
Uh, but as Pete has just walked through, with the cooperation of the city, with someone kicking in the land for free or at very low cost, with an agreement uh, with the city, uh, you can they can be a source of affordable housing for primarily for the homeless. If you scroll back up to this picture, I'm going to go back up for a second. This is in Olympia, Washington. I guarantee you that drainage pond is fine for an alternative to a tented camp. Matter of fact, it looks like it's engineered and it's much better than you get in a tented camp. It's probably, health and safety-wise, a very good solution for this. But I guarantee you that's not a drainage pond that would meet subdivision standards for a permanent jurisdiction. So these things are being negotiated, and you need the partnership of the, the city or the county uh, to make it work financially and to kind of get around the fact that they're not going to meet current subdivision standards. All right, here we are at the end. Um, I've given our contact information, uh, Pete's email, my email. I'll repeat it again. If you'd like a copy of this PowerPoint, just email us. Or the link at the bottom is to uh, a, is to our uh, YouTube channel uh, where we'll post the recording of this session. And if you want it, you can get it. And if you know somebody who tried to get on and couldn't get on, uh, please tell them they can do that. We will send a notice like this out to people for those who didn't get on. Let's take a few questions. The first two talking about audio, and I'm sorry, here's Janet Buck has several questions. Um, what are typical square footages of tiny houses? Can you provide a range as well when you're done with the presentation? Uh, we have seen them as small, well, I've seen one, I think, advertised itself as 75 square feet, but the norm is anywhere from 120 to uh, 600 square feet. The norm would, I think, is in the two to three to 400 foot range. Um, and you can tell why, because they are towable. Uh, Pete, do you have a, anything to add to that? Nope. Okay. Um, cottage neighborhood standard. Well, let's, let's talk just a little bit more about that. They, I've never seen them as big as 800 square feet. For those of you who are planners, 800 square feet is the general size of a single wide manufactured home. Uh, they're usually half that size. Um, and if you get down, as I said, below uh, a certain, below 100 square feet, you really got to question whether you're going to be able to meet the uh, construction codes, the International Residential Code. I mean, you can take it off, put it on a foundation, and find out that the sum total of all your living areas, even though it passed RV standards, doesn't pass the International uh, Residential Code standards at at something under 100 feet, you'd, I'd be scratching my head. Um, can you give an example of a cottage neighborhood standard? Yes, uh, Kirkland, Washington, and several of the communities around Seattle have worked with either the cottage company or the Sewell company to develop some of the images, the cottages whose images we showed you. Um, they sometimes say things like, uh, the example I, I give builds on what Pete said. Um, the, the guy comes in and says, look, you're zoned, this is zoned for 10 lot, ten homes, this little infill parcel zoned for 10 homes or five homes, uh, and let's assume they'd be 2,500 square foot homes. That's a certain number. That's 12,500 square feet of floor area. Tell you what, let's not count homes. Let's count floor area. You give me the right to build 12,500 square feet of floor area, and you don't care how many homes I build. I will lay out the roads. I will take care of them privately. Uh, I will have a collective parking area over at one end for the five houses in order to have smaller lots. It's really an infill strategy for pocket neighborhoods that allows you to build small units and lay it out. Uh, I hate to say this because it's, it's not in, like an RV park. You've got sites, but then you've got communal facilities that support them and maybe a communal parking area. So they often regulate the total square footage rather than the number of units. They allow narrower streets and less parking, but they almost always allow, require the uh, owner of the property to maintain the infrastructure. Uh, this is how, when you see pictures of cottage neighborhoods or RV uh, subdivisions or cute loop lanes and things like that, uh, you scratch your head and say, wow, I wonder how they got their public works department to agree to that level of street or infrastructure or pipes or wires or connectivity. Uh, I will bet you a cup of coffee that three times out of four, the answer is uh, public works didn't sign off on that. The guy agreed to take care of it completely himself, and he's having to collect dues in order to do that. Uh, Don, I'll, I'll reiterate, if, if folks are wanting to see some examples, Washington State, where Kirkland is, uh, many good example there, examples of communities, cottage housing communities that have been built from 
I think white picket fence little homes surrounding a central courtyard where the kids can play or throw a frisbee or other more agricultural oriented a, a central garden area that's um, just more of an in, in nature kind of a vibe but a totally different set of standards that has allowed for this and Bainbridge Island Washington where I used to live I know had some standards uh, many years ago they might still that's a specific community I can think of in addition to Kirkland yeah I just to reiterate when you see cottage neighborhoods those are generally not on the affordable end of the spectrum uh, they're charging a premium for those things uh, that's that's we wanted to cover affordable housing because people think small is affordable. Uh, some of these are not anything but affordable. Um, they're quite expensive sometimes. Let's hit the rest of the questions quickly. Resale value, well, no, I haven't done a study of it. I will say this, I got on Craigslist and looked for them and they're a lot lower on Craigslist than they are in the brochures. Um, I think what's happening is not that they depreciate. I think a number of people have bought these thinking they could live in them. They can't live in them. They try to sell them and Little by little, people are coming, getting smarter about where they're going to be able to use these. And so I guess I will I will uh, take the slings and arrows of the industry and just say, my experience is the resale values are substantially lower than the initial values. Um, that's true of most manufactured housing, too. If a town has adopted a building code, the international code, to apply to residential structures, then somebody puts an R RV house on an RV on a permanent are adapted as a permanent dwelling, then isn't that non-conforming to the adopted building code? Well, yes, unless the home is of a size and the foundation and utility hookups meet the building code. Um, once again, that's why you're translating, you're moving from RV standards to building code standards. Most jurisdictions would say, if you want to take the wheels off your RV, you're asking me the power to turn it into a house. Fine, but it's got to meet a different code. It's got to be a different code. And if you just do it, you just lay cinder block and put it on there, it's probably non-conforming. It's a building code violation and maybe a zoning code violation. But if they do it right and it's big enough and it actually meets the building code, the international building code, then it might not be. But I think your your comment is correct. Most of many of them meet the RV standards, do not meet the uh, residential building code standards. And some of them do. Last one, how, how about use of tiny houses for short-term commercial accommodations? Well, um, I'm not quite sure what you mean. Uh, if you mean, could you put it on as a caretaker residence uh, for a warehouse or a, an industrial complex? Sure. I, I mean, once again, uh, the, the local government can do whatever it wants to. It can even say, um, look, this doesn't meet the International Building Code, but it meets the RV code. We're going to let you put it on a foundation and mount it here. And yes, for the sake in this zoning district, we are going to uh, not apply the International Building Code. We're going to apply the RV code to this. So the, you could do that uh, for short-term accommodations or, for example, a sales lot, uh, a, a, a residential leasing office or a construction office. Once again, what the city approves as a temporary use is usually pretty loose. Uh, they know you're not living in it a long time. It has to meet safety standards, but they're not going to hold you to the same standards as if it was going to be lived in for a long period of time. So, And Don, I, I think that's a really interesting question. I'm thinking of pop-up stores, food trucks, uh, the things that are happening now that you see where local planners are scratching their head going, how do I issue a temporary building permit here? And how much traffic is this going to generate? And what? And so that's something new. This is the topic for maybe a future webinar yeah. is, you know, how, how have those temporary mobile but pretty uh, popular uh, commercial enterprises starting up and could you start selling something out of a tiny home? Well, are you creative enough? I think people could. <laughs> All right. Um, we thank you for being here. We've got uh, a lot of you are still on the, the, the uh, webinar. Thank you for attending. I hope you found it useful. Please do not hesitate to get on our website and listen to the recording or if you know somebody who couldn't get on, get the recording or ask us for the PowerPoint and we'd be happy to send it to you. Thank you again for attending. Bye. Thanks, everybody.